A very warm welcome to our morning service on the 21st of June. Today is Father's Day and so I want to wish all the fathers God's blessing on you as you maybe are still bringing up your children who live at home with you or as your children have now flown the nest you love and care for them. May God bless you in your family life and especially in your relationship with your wife. And for those who aren't fathers, I trust that you will have a good and blessed day. Well, shall we bow in prayer? Loving and eternal God in heaven, we thank you that on this day we are found in your presence. Father, we thank you that it is the Lord's day. Thank you, Heavenly Father, that we are found, Lord, still and quiet before you. We have laid all the troubles of the past week and all the labours of the past week aside. And we thank you for this day, a market day for the soul, a soul, a day when we can receive your teaching, where we can be fed with, Lord, many good truths. And we pray, Father, that this day might be a day which continues on, Lord, the blessings of it in the coming week, that it might be as it were, we've gone shopping one day in seven and we've received so many goods. May that be for us this day. Oh, Father in heaven, we thank you that this day our Lord Jesus, as every day, is reigning in glory. And we thank you that you are fulfilling your purposes. We praise you that the Holy Spirit has been given, shed abroad upon, upon this world. We thank you that he is amongst his people. And where two or three are gathered together in his name, he is there. We remember the early church that could not meet in public buildings, but often gathered in small groups of 10 or 12 or 3 or 4, or a house packed out, or a room where the people of God were gathered. And we thank you, Father, that you were present with them, building your church. Oh, Father in heaven, we pray that as we are still in lockdown, that we would remember, Lord, that you are present with us. Lord, we long for the day when we can gather and see more people, and where we can gather and see one another face to face and sing your praises together. But Lord, we know that we are not in one sense totally missing out because you speak to us from your word in our own homes. Father, may we treat this worship service as we would any other worship service. Help us not to be distracted. Help us not to wander away, Lord, from the presence of God. Help us, Lord, to listen intently to your word. Help us, Lord, to engage in the singing of these wonderful hymns with all of our hearts. And may we know your blessing, Lord. May we sanctify this day in our hearts. And Lord, as we study again the Ten Commandments, we pray, Father, that the truths of your Holy Word, of these Ten Commandments, deeply impact our souls and our lives. Lord, today we are looking at the Second Commandment, that we should not make any idols, any graven images. And Father, we pray truly that if there are any idols in our hearts, that you would help us to tear them from the throne of our hearts and we would worship only you. And Father, if there are any ways in which we are disobeying this command, that you would reveal that to us and that we would repent and turn gladly again to you. So Father, be with us and have mercy, O Lord, upon our nation at this time. May many hearts be turned back to the living God. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, please, would you turn with me to the book of Exodus, chapter 34, reading verses 1 to 17. Last week, our brother Henry, he took us to the first commandment, you shall have no other gods before me. And today we're going to consider the second commandment, you shall make no graven images. So please turn with me to Exodus chapter 34, reading from verse 1 to verse 17. This is after the incident of the destroying of those two tablets of stone, the Ten Commandments inscribed upon them. Moses was incensed with the people of God as he'd found them worshipping a golden calf. And so we read this, chapter 34, verse 1. And the Lord said to Moses, Cut two tablets of stone like the first ones, and I will write on these tablets the words that were on the first tablets which you broke. So be ready in the morning and come up in the morning to Mount Sinai and present yourself to me there on the top of the mountain. And no man shall come up with you 
And let no man be seen throughout all the mountain. Let neither flocks nor herds feed before the mountain. So he cut two tablets of stone like the first ones. Then Moses rose early in the morning and went up Mount Sinai as the Lord had commanded him. And he took in his hand the two tablets of stone. Now the Lord descended in the cloud and stood with him there and proclaimed the name of the Lord. And the Lord passed before him and proclaimed, The Lord, the Lord God, merciful and gracious, long-suffering and abounding in goodness and truth, keeping mercy for thousands, forgiving iniquity and transgressions and sin, by no means clearing the guilty, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children and the children's children to the third and the fourth generation. So Moses made haste and bowed his head toward the earth and worshipped. Then he said, If now I have found grace in your sight, O Lord, let my Lord, I pray, go among us, even though we are a stiff-necked people, and pardon our iniquity and our sin, and take us as your inheritance. And he said, Behold, I make a covenant before all your people. I will do marvels such as have not been done in all the earth, nor in any nation, and all the people among whom you are, sh whom you are shall see the work of the Lord. For it is an awesome thing that I will do with you. Observe what I command you this day. Behold, I am driving out from before you the Amorite and the Canaanite and the Hittite and the Perizzite and the Hevite and the Jebusite. Take heed to yourself, lest you make a covenant with the inhabitants of the land where you are going, lest it be a snare in your midst. But you shall destroy their altars, break their sacred pillars and cut down their wooden images. For you shall worship no other god. For the Lord, whose name is Jealous, is a jealous God. Lest you make a covenant with the inhabitants of the land, and they play the harlot with their gods, and make sacrifices to their gods, and one of them invites you, and you eat of his sacrifice. And you shall take of his daughters for your sons, and, and his daughters play the harlot with their gods, and make your sons play the harlot with their gods. You shall make no moulded gods for yourselves. So reads the word of God. Now we're coming to the second commandment this morning. And I just want to remind ourselves again about these Ten Commandments. The Ten Commandments, the law of God, are given to reveal sin. By the law is the knowledge of sin. By the law we understand what transgression is. And the law condemns us as it says, you shall not. And as we examine our lives in the light of this law, we realise that many a time we have broken it. The law says we shall honour our father and mother. And many a times we've broken that. The law of God says you shall not bear false testimony. And we have been guilty of lying. And this morning... We look at this law, you shall make no graven images. And we're reminded of this truth that that exposes the heart of man who often makes idols. Through the law is the knowledge of sin. But when we understand the exceedingly sinfulness of sin, as the Holy Spirit works in our lives, it drives us to Jesus Christ, drives us to plead with God for mercy. That's the point of the Ten Commandments. They show a standard that we cannot keep. We see in Jesus Christ that he has kept the law for us and he's died for us and he's risen from the dead and we come to the cross of Christ and ask for mercy and we find forgiveness. We've read of a God who is slow to anger, full of loving kindness and mercy. A God who abounds in loving kindness and mercy, forgiving iniquities, transgressions, sins to thousands and thousands of generations to all who call upon him 
a glorious gospel message to those who are transgressors. So the law shows our sin and drives us to Christ. But for the Christian, it also, it is also used by God in our sanctification. The righteous requirements of the law, by God's grace, are being fulfilled in us through the work of the Holy Spirit as we've been conformed to the character of Christ. So the law is not only her ministry of condemnation, but by God's grace, God uses his law to conform us to the very character of Christ for those who are redeemed. Now, verse 4 of Exodus chapter 20 appears quite very, well, very basic, doesn't it? You shall not make any graven images. But let's read right from verse 1 to verse 6. And we'll look at the context of this commandment, you shall not make any graven images. And God spoke all these words saying, I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make for yourself a carved image, any likeness of anything that is in heaven above or that is on the earth beneath or that is is in the water under the earth. And you shall not bow down to them nor serve them, for I am the Lord your God, and I'm a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children to the third and fourth generations of those who hate me, but showing mercy to thousands, to those who love me and keep my commandments. So initially it seems quite basic. It's a command of prohibition. We cannot make a sculpture, a statue. We cannot make any image of God. No painting, no icons, no representation of God. It's very clear. But as we consider this and the wider context of the scripture, we're reminded that it's not just a a prohibition of things that we, we shouldn't do. But as we reflect upon the teaching of Christ and the wider context of scripture, we realise that this commandment is not just what you shall not do, but behind it is, is all about what we should do in worship. You see, we have words here in verses five and six that remind us of the character of God. At the end of verse six, it reminds us that God is a merciful God to all those who love him, to those who keep his commandments. You see, this negative prohibition is set in that wider context of those who ought to worship truly before him by loving him and keeping his commandments. But then we also have in verse 5 the warning. We not only have that promise of mercy to those who keep his commandments, but the warning of judgment, of God visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon their children to the third and fourth generation. So God is saying, be very careful about me. Be very careful about how you worship me. So this morning, we're looking at what is true worship. The first commandment that Henry dealt with last week was dealing with the object of worship. You shall have no other gods before me. You shall have no other gods before my presence, before my face. Me only shall you worship. It's all about him. The second commandment is like it, but there's a difference. It's not primarily about the object of worship, but it's about the manner in which we worship God. No graven images with the backdrop of who God is, who God is in in his total character. And here we have two aspects represented in verses five and six. The aspect of his holiness, his righteousness, and his justice in verse 5. And in verse 6, the aspect of his love, and his mercy, and his kindness. And in the light of this balanced view of God, his holiness, and his love, his justice, and his mercy. In the light of the character of God, So we ought to obey this command not to ever make a graven image, but worship him in spirit and in truth. So this morning, true worship. First of all, what is prohibited. Secondly, 
what is commanded, and thirdly, what should be our response. Well, what is prohibited? It's very clear, isn't it? Verse 4. You shall not make for yourself a carved image, any likeness of anything that is in heaven above. And we know that's sadly been the case. There's been many people who've worshipped the sun and the stars and the moon. There's even been people who've worshipped birds. And we're told this, we're not to make a representation of any of these objects in heaven above. Because as we do that, the heart then, in its desires and its affections, goes to that object and worships it and worship the thing often it represents. Neither should we make a carved image of things on the earth beneath the heavens, no animals, no reptiles, or things in the water under the earth. No fish. The Egyptians were guilty of this. And immediately we're to say that none of these things, none of created things, nothing in nature, no trees, no mountains, no stars, no fish in the sea, no animals, none of this can be an adequate representation of the holy almighty God. In fact, it brings him down and it insults him. So what's prohibited? No form or representation of God in nature, whether it's through sculpture, picture or icon. But also we're reminded that it's about worship, no idol worship. Verse 5, you shall not bow down to them. You see, it's not a prohibition to just you can't paint a picture of a landscape and put it on your mantelpiece. It's not saying that. It's all about worship. You shall not bow down to this statue or this idol. You shall not kiss it. You shall not venerate it. You shall not use it as a vehicle for worship, worshipping God. Remember when we were in Brazil and there were many Roman Catholics who had statues of saints or statues of Jesus or statues of Mary in their homes. It was a very real thing. People would pray towards them, bow down before them, touch them, kiss them. It was part of their worship. And numbers of Roman Catholics were converted as they considered the Ten Commandments as a man in our first church in the interior. And he said it was this truth about you shall not make a graven image that made him give up the Catholic Church. And then he began to seek God. I remember also in our little town of Alvarines in the West Amazon of the Padre uh, in the church, in the Roman Catholic Church, coming to the, the belief that he had to get rid of all the icons and all the statues in the church. And he did that because it wasn't according to the Ten Commandments. But the mayor of the town threw him out of the town. You see, there's sadly in many cultures and many religions... This idea that we can make a representation of God or a holy person through a statue and use it in worship. And it's in direct contradiction to the scriptures. But you know, this command goes wider than that. You see, we can make a representation of God in our minds, in our imaginations. And we can think of God not according to what is written in scripture, but in, according to our vain thoughts about God, conjure up an idea of who we think he ought to be. That, that's breaking his command. But then as we go wider than that, the New Testament, he says things like this, covetousness is idolatry. Anything that takes the place of God and steals our affections from him, anything that robs God of his rightful place in our lives as Lord and Master, Anything that takes God's place is idolatry, whether it's the love of money, whether it's the love of the job, and my job becomes all-consuming, and uh, God is there in the background. Whatever the idol is, if it's possessions, if it's pleasure, if it's sex, if it's entertainment, even if it's a hobby that dominates me, if anything takes the place of God, that is idolatry. 
So then let's consider this. We're looking at what's prohibit, prohibited to begin with. Later we're going to look at what's commanded. But why are these representations, why is the carving of an idol with a tool wrong? Well, think of this. Think of the being of God. God is utterly other than. God is not like us. God is eternal. He has no beginning and no end. He's immortal. But he's also invisible. God is spirit. God has no parts. He has no body. God is so unlike us. He is the high and the lofty one that inhabits eternity. He looks upon the earth and the nations are like a drop in the bucket. The inhabitants are like grasshoppers. And we would reduce God to a little statue. We would think that we could depict the being of God in that way. It's an insult to him. How could we ever localise God? How could we ever reduce him to something that is limited? Our God is a living God. Why would we want to reduce him to something that cannot speak? An idol cannot speak, something that cannot hear, cannot act. Our God is a God who, who acts. He acts in this earth. He has made this world. It's a God who speaks. He is the living God. Why would we reduce him to a dumb idol? And so, through the prophet Isaiah, God says, to whom will you liken me? His glory he will not give to another. All representations of God are demeaning and bring him down. So, as we consider the, the being of God, we realise that all representations of him just cannot justify who he is. The ever-present, eternal God. How can he be localised into a, a little statue? But then also we think about the character of God. Now some people argue that a relic or a statue or a painting helps the wor worshipper contemplate something about the divinity of God. So as we have a statue of Jesus... And we look at him and we look at his eye, into his eyes and we maybe see um, representations of blood in his hands and it just reminds us of the love of God and it helps us to worship God. But I would say the absolute opposite is true. The character of God is actually distorted by that image. That image will say nothing about the complete character of God. And it may and does distort the very love of God. The complete character of God is written down in the scriptures, which speak about his wisdom, his eternal wisdom, which speak about his faithfulness, which, which reveals his absolute holiness and purity, which speaks about that eternal love, which is love sinners before the foundation of the earth, that a statue cannot speak to these things. You see, the statues bypass the word of God. It's only God's word that reveals the true character of God. All statues distort the true nature of God. And isn't it wonderful that some of the men now have an opportunity to look at this 16-part series. Steve Lawson preaching on the attributes of God, how we need to know our God. So why? Why is the making of statue prohibited? Firstly, because it does not do justice to the being of God. Secondly, because it cannot represent the character of God. And thirdly, because our God is a jealous God. What do we read in Exodus chapter 34 and verse 14? For you shall worship no other God, for the Lord whose name is jealous is a jealous God. His very name is jealous. He's jealous for his own glory. He will not share his glory with another. And he's jealous for his people. He's in covenant relationship with them. He has betrothed 
himself to his people and he will not have them go after other gods. He will not have them commit spiritual adultery. You see, a loving husband, a human husband, he is jealous for the affections of his wife. He will not have a third party intervene. He will not have this third party, this other man, steal her affections. He is jealous for her. So our God, whose name is Jealous, is jealous for his glory and he's jealous for the love of his people. And so he will not have them reduce him to something which is so small and insignificant. And he will not tolerate any allegiance to any other God. Joshua would say this in Joshua chapter 24 and verse 15. He said this as a challenge to God's people. If it seems evil to you to serve the Lord, choose for yourselves this day whom you will serve, whether the gods which your fathers served that were on the other side of the river or the gods of the Amorites in whose land you dwell. But as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. There's a choice set before you and there's a demand of God. What will it be? Will you worship the gods of the nations or will you worship the true and living God, Yahweh, Jehovah, who is in covenant with you? And then he says in verse 19 to the people of God, you can't just serve God just any old how. You cannot serve the Lord for he is a holy God. He is a jealous God. He will not forgive your transgressions nor your sins. If you forsake the Lord and serve foreign gods, then he will turn and do harm and consume you after he has done good. You can't just say, yes, I'll serve God and and continue half-heartedly with a worldly heart. You cannot love God and love this world. The lust of the eyes, the pride of life, the lust of the flesh. You cannot indulge in these things and say you love God. You must have an undivided heart. What did Elijah say? Challenge the people. If the Lord is God, follow him. But if you think Baal is God, follow him. Choose who you will serve. And did not our Lord Jesus Christ say this? No man can serve two masters. He will either hate the one or love the other. You cannot serve God and mammon. You cannot serve God and money in the system of this world. You see, this commandment is prohibiting all forms of idolatry because God is a jealous God and he will not share his glory with another. He's commanding that we should worship him him with a whole heart, with complete devotion. And as this command was being given to Moses on Mount Sinai. At that very time when he was 40 days and 40 nights in the mountain with God, speaking to God as a, as a man speaks to his friend, at that very moment, the people of God, even through his brother Aaron, were fashioning an idol, a golden calf. And they worshipped it. They danced around it. Aaron said, well, this is a feast day to the Lord. And they're pretending that that they were some ways worshipping Jehovah through it. But he said, this is your God, the God that brought you out of Egypt. And the Lord came. And the Lord brought judgment upon that people for their sin. And Moses, when he came to the mountain and saw the idolatry and was so angry with the people, smashing the Ten Commandments, he then called them to, to make a decision. Will you worship the Lord if you do come this way? But if not, God's anger will fall upon you. God is a jealous God. So what is prohibited in this second commandment? Any representation of God, firstly. But secondly, any idol worship. But now positively, what does the command positively say? Well, it's all about worship, isn't it? It's not a prohibition of any form of art, 
not even of religious art. It doesn't mean that we have to destroy a Rembrandt of Jesus. It's not saying that. It's about worship, you see. It's about not bowing down and worshipping an idol. It's about not using any image to evoke or stimulate or help you in worship. That's the negative. But then the positive must be this. Is then a call. You see, Jesus interpreted the Ten Commandments which had this negative tone, you shall not, you shall not, you shall not. He interpreted them positively. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind and strength and you shall love your neighbour as yourself. And so this is a call to bow down and worship God for who he is. Now it's interesting, the word worship. In the Greek language, it comes from two Greek words. The first word means towards. The second word means kiss. In other words, the Greek language as used in Holy Scripture is saying that worship is towards one object. And it's towards that object with affection towards kiss is about fellowship communion is about the heart it's about love that's the greek rendering of this word worship the hebrew rendering means to prostrate oneself over and over that's repeated in scripture look at verse 8 of exodus 34 so moses made haste and bowed his head toward the earth and worshipped. And so often in scripture, we see people upon their faces before God. Worship in scripture is to do with prostrating oneself in awe before the living God. Think of Revelation chapter 4 and verse 10. There we have a picture of heaven. There we have the 24 elders bowing down. The 24 elders fall down before him who sits on the throne and worship him who lives forever and cast their crowns before the throne. The Hebrew rendering of the word is to do with prostration, bowing down. But then the English rendering, well, the 1611 King James Version was translated in in this way. Worship, sorry, worthy ship, worthy ship. That became contracted later to the word worship, So from worthyship to worship, and then it became our word worthy. But let's go back to the original, worthyship. He is worthy, worthy of all honour and praise and adoration. Revelation 4 and verse 11. You are worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honour and power, for you created all things, and by your will they exist and were created. He is worthy, worthy of all adoration and praise because of who he is. So what does that mean? It means that he is our sovereign, that he is our Lord, that he is our King. It means that lip surface is not enough. Jesus would say, these people worship me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. Worship is about falling down before the living God with the heart. And it's about serving him, a life of obedience. Do you remember what the Lord Jesus Christ said to Satan when Satan sought to tempt him to fall down and worship him? And Jesus said, he rebuked Satan and said, you shall worship the Lord your God and him only you shall serve. Positively, What does the second commandment mean? It's speaking about true worship. What is it saying? It's saying loving God with a heart in form of real service and obedience. It's about the whole of one's life. I beseech you, therefore, by the mercies of God, that you present your body, your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable before God, which is your reasonable service which is your spiritual worship present yourself as a living sacrifice before God this is your reasonable worship do not be conformed to this world 
but be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is that good and perfect and acceptable will of God. This is worship, is laying our lives before him, a life of obedience. And so we have verses 5 and 6 of Exodus chapter 20, which bring up the consequences of not obeying this requirement of God to worship him with the whole of our lives, not just on Sundays, but lives of holiness throughout the week. If people continue in sin and in disobedience, if they reject God as their master and Lord, if they hate him and turn to idols, whatever those idols may be, God has said that there will be consequences for their children, for their grandchildren, even to the third and the fourth generation. If we imbibe the culture of this world, if we love money more than God, if we love possessions, it's all about what I can get. We spend all our time about what I can get and all our time is about keeping what I've, what I've got. If it's a, a life centred on self, exorbitant amounts of time upon my entertainment, upon my pleasure, it's not about serving the living God. Well, not, not only will I suffer, but my children will suffer and my grandchildren, generations afterwards, will suffer. We reap what we sow. Now, of course, this isn't saying that if a, a child is repentant and righteous before God, that they will suffer for the sins of their fathers. Ezekiel 18 says this. No, if my father sins, he's responsible for his sin. And if I please God and honour him, well, I will not be judged for my father's sin. That's very clear. Hezekiah, he was a godly man. His father was a wicked man. But we are saying that where there is this unrepentant wickedness, in the heart of man. That would have a downward spiral upon future generations. And so you see it, you see in families, fathers who've been lazy and drunkards and drug addicts, and that seems to just be followed on to their children, and then maybe that follows on to their grandchildren. Vicious cycles. And the Lord says that's part of my judgment, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the third and the fourth generation, to those who hate me. And you know it is to, to the unbeliever, but we realise as well that when believers fall into gross sin, it may have awful consequences upon their family. We think of David, his sin of adultery with Bathsheba and the effect that had upon his children. You see, we're to take this commandment very seriously. But then verse 6, it's the promise it says this, and the comparison is to the three and the four and the thousands. You see in verse five, it's about three and four, the third and the fourth generation suffering. But here the contrast is, but God shows mercy to thousands. He is a compassionate God, a loving God. And the thousands would imply thousands of generations. He is a kind God to all who call upon him and repent. You see, within this covenant of law, within this ministration of death, and condemnation, we see yet the promises of grace because it begins, these Ten Commandments, with a word to the redeemed, to God's people. And so we have promises of grace to all who love him and to all who keep his commandments, mercy upon mercy upon mercy. So what does this command positively mean? It means positively that God will show kindness and mercy to all who love and obey him and worship from the heart sacrificially in obedience to his commands. But also as we go into the New Testament, the wider context, we think of worshipping God in spirit and in truth. Positively, Christ has said it's not about the physical. It's not about the paraphernalia. In John 4, the woman was wor worried about which mountain they should worship on. Would it be Jerusalem or would it be her mountain? Jesus said it's not to do with the physical, it's not to do with the temple. True worship is worship in spirit, it's spiritual worship. It's from the heart, it's inward. 
The Pharisees were concerned with the outward. They were concerned with being seen by men. It was about their clothes. Jesus condemned them when they were, had long tassels. It was about show. It was about long prayers. It was all about the externals. And Jesus said it's about the heart. Worshipping in the Spirit and by the Holy Spirit. And it's in truth. It's according to God's word that we must worship. We cannot do anything forbidden by God's word in worship. In public worship, in family worship, and in private worship. It must all be ruled by the word of God. Public worship is ordained that we should pray. It's ordained that we should sing. It's ordained that we should read God's word. It's ordained that we should preach God's word. Baptism is ordained. The Lord's Supper is ordained. And so we worship God according to the rule of his word. When churches compromise, we read about the seven churches. We read about the church in Thyatira, who sadly had compromised by allowing the people to offer to idols and permitting sexual immorality. We read about the church in Pergamos, who now took on board the doctrine of the Nicolaitans, and also offered to idols. When God's people compromise and don't do things according to God's word, judgment comes. Jesus would have us worship in spirit and in truth. And then lastly, how are we to worship? Well, the New Testament tells us that we're to worship God through Jesus Christ. We're not to make images, but there is one image that we can worship. And that is Jesus Christ. He is the express image of the Father. He is the in image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. And we are called to worship him and worship the Father through him. Angels and men before him fall. Our greatest joy and our greatest pleasure is to worship God through Jesus Christ. There is only one mediator between God and man. No relic, no statue, no sculpture could ever help us and be a mediator between us and God. There is one, the man Christ Jesus. He said, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. He reflects the very character of God because he is God and he's one with the Father. How are we to worship God through his son, Jesus Christ? And then lastly and briefly, what is our response? Well, it's been a serious message, hasn't it? And so we must be very careful that we make no depictions of Jesus Christ and of God the Father or God the Holy Spirit. There may be books about Jesus and drawings and things for children, and we're not saying, we're not docetists and want to represent Jesus as some sort of phantom. It's not wrong to have maybe a picture of Jesus walking to Jerusalem on a donkey. We're not worshipping that, but we have to be very careful in that area. No cartoons, no misrepresentations. We've got to be very careful with films as well. Jesus wasn't a white man with, with fair hair and blue eyes. Uh, we, we have to be very careful with these things. And above all, we say to the world that there is only one God and there is only one Son, his Jesus Christ, and one Holy Spirit. There's only one God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Pluralism is wrong. Other religions are not worshipping the same God. There's only one God and we must make no image of him. And then we must say this, that if we expect loyalty in our lives, you expect loyalty from your friends, don't you? It's painful when a friend isn't loyal or a family member. A family member doesn't want to, 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 to meet with you and talk with you. That, that's sad. Or, or in church life, we expect loyalty. Well, what about God? He's not just expecting loyalty. He's expecting and demands absolute allegiance. The most terrible thing that a person can do is to turn their back on God 
is betrayal. Judas did that. He betrayed the Lord Jesus for the love of money. God isn't just wanting your loyalty. He's wanting your heart and your life and your all. The Apostle Paul, his life was spent in preaching Jesus Christ. And he had a jealousy for God's people. He says this in 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 2. For I am jealous for you with a godly jealousy, for I have betrothed you to one husband, that I may present you as a chaste virgin to Christ. That was Paul's concern. I've got a godly jealousy over you. Oh, that you and I would have a godly jealousy for the church, that we would truly honour him and be a pure virgin before him. But all that we as individuals will pledge ourselves afresh to this living God and worship him as he is declared in his word, never worshipping him according to an imagination that we have of him, or according to the view of people in the world, but worshipping him according to Holy Scripture, God's revealed truth. And may he have all the glory in our lives. And may we enjoy him. And may we find that this law is a law of freedom, is a law of liberty, is a law of love to God and love to our neighbour. May God bless this word to your heart. Amen. Shall we pray? Father in heaven, we thank you for your word to us this morning. If there is anything that is not in accord with your word, I pray that it will be forgotten. And Lord, it would be, Lord, put to one side. But everything that is in accordance to your word, I pray that each one of you, of us, might obey from the heart what your word is saying to us this morning. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, may God bless you as we meet together this evening for another service. May God be with us as we sing his praises. Have a good day and a happy Father's Day to all.